over to sir professor good morning and welcome to you all a very warm happy sunday of learning uh, we have covered almost 17 sessions till now from january and it has benefited a whole range of post graduates from final year to first year so as you all know you all have been uh, recently joined and the way they start your uh, curriculum is uh, you have to go through history of anesthesia the if only if you know the uh, past you will have a bright future and likewise the, the second topic is on the breadwinner of spinal uh, uh, anesthesia that is spinal anesthesia But these two topics are covered by doins in anesthesia uh, the first one is selva kumar sir and the other one is edward johnson sir both are uh, uh, very fierce teachers so welcome selva kumar sir and uh, edward sir uh, uh, selva kumar sir is he's been my teacher uh, since uh, a long he is teaching for a very long time and uh, uh, two generations of anesthetists he have is created now and uh, sir is the hod of madurai medical college he has been an active member in isa uh, past president secretary and uh, i think no conference uh, is complete without sir's uh, uh, speeches and especially his history is so lucid that you will you will hear it like a story from him so we are waiting for that let me go into uh, the topic welcome sir lokma sir thank you siva good morning edward <clears throat> my dear colleagues and friends and my dear students uh, you have entered into anesthesia curriculum and i welcome you with the so called boring topic people may think that history is boring uh, but it is not so so only when you know the history problem next slide is not going yeah only when you know the history when you know about the past the future will be bright as sulpas has correctly pointed out history is never boring especially our field anesthesia so to go into the history of anesthesia we have to know about what has happened some 100 and 200 years back pain was accepted as a normal phenomenon god has given the pain so nobody should try to relieve it that's why anesthesia has not developed those days but if you think that pain is it a blessing or a curse people will try to think that pain is a curse but it is not so it is a blessing only when you have pain then only a uh, animal can survive the best example is leprosy a toe affected by lepromatous leprosy definitely uh the next day morning when he gets up uh, the rat will take away the toe without pain he will not be able to save his limb like that so pain has to be there but certain procedures in the body have to be performed unless otherwise the pain is tackled but pain is a mysterious phenomena when the tolerance of pain is very high especially when it is linked with religion or patient the best example is this one this fellow uh, does he not have any pain or this girl so called very sensitive area does he not have pain definitely they will have pain but uh, somehow they tolerate it so but from the days of stone age we are trying to conquer the pain that's why that's how the anesthesia developed so we all know that some 175 or 80 years back uh, the first demonstration of uh, painless surgery happened in uh, america boston before that uh, we just want to know what they did before martin so what has happened in the pre era so in those era the surgery was an agony especially some three or four surgeries were performed very frequently one a mangled foot amputation circumcision for religious reason and the barhol tapping thinking that some bad woman has entered into your body putting a hole in the skull will make you disease free something like that some three or four surgeries were performed and they were done like that so many anesthetists were there you can notice and and again another thing is pain relief was often linked to the religion so nobody has dared to attempt the pain relief so anesthesia didn't develop at all but there was a drug 
there is a drug. Even now, it is the best drug as far as analgesia property is considered. So, it has been uh, ruling mankind for more than 4,000 years. Even now, that is considered as queen of analgesia. A beautiful flower, poppy flower. The liquid extract from that unripe fruit, uh, unripe uh, flower, has to be taken out, that latex, it has to be dried and alkaloids, morphine, divine, and codeine were extracted. There is some interesting finding about uh, morphine. The, it was used well in, even in 3400 BC. There was mentioning in the ancient literature, it was considered as a joy plant. And since it caused uh, some fraught, if it is uh, consumed excessively, some probably palmedima. So it was named as Akifina, that is, that is venomous fraught. So in, even in Indian and Italian, Greek literature, everything, Roman literature, everything it was mentioned the, about uh, the morphine. It was mentioned as halji, meaning a joy plant. So it was rather misused, but not medically used. So even Greek gods, they want to decorate their gods with the poppy flower. So poppy, flower, poppy seeds and poppy flowers and poppy extract were very, very popular. Even 1500 BC, it was mentioned in Ibaras Papyrus, that was one of the best book uh, in the ancient time. He has suggested you can stop crying in a child using grains of poppy plants strained to your pulp. Very easy method. Then they started mixing, I don't know, I didn't go into the detail of ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol started ruling the all over the world, even now. Even the government has to run with ethyl alcohol. This chemical, how we came into the, the human civilization. But somehow they found the ethyl alcohol with opium very powerful in relieving pain and producing euphoria. Mainly these drugs were used to cause euphoria. The side effect happened to be pain relief and it was found accidentally. And uh, he, he said, I am considered that is the best gift given by the God. That even if you go through the Indian history, East India Company, which ruled India before independence, they grown poppy in so many parts of India, they cultivated it, they exported it to other country and they earned a lot of money. So India was uh, a place where opium was cultivated. Now it is made, it's banned. So after the opium, and another interesting plant is mandragora. So I just came through the literature, the very funny plant, there was a belief, this plant has got tubers. And these tubers have to be buried out from the ground to pulp it and then consume it. It contains active alkaloids, atropines, copalamine, and hyosamine. So some kind of euphoria was produced because of the consumption of this tuber. But problem is, there was a belief that if you dig out this uh, tuber, it will start screen because the tubers resemble human siblings. So if you want to bury, if you want to take it out from the ground, you have to tie it with your dogs on the other end. And if you run away, your dog will also try to come with you. At that time, that uh, the tuber will be plucked out from the uh, ground. And then the, the dog will hear the scream, it seems, and the dog will die. Those who ever hear the scream of that uh, tuber, people will die, it seems. So they believe like that. So that's how it was being dug out. And they, the, these tubers resemble like uh, a small human sibling. That's why they appeared. But it was not so. Belief is like that. This clipping is taken from uh, Harry Potter. Even it beautifully depicts the this uh, tubers. I have unmuted it so you can just listen. You can see very interesting to know that even cinema cinema people have known about this mandragora. And the term mandrake, if whoever has read about the comic books, magician mandrake character is there. That mandrake is taken from this mandragora. It is nothing but scopolamine. So we all know that this uh, atropine and scopolamine can produce euphoria and delirium. We have seen in OPC poisoning patients. So she just demonstrates, and they they are wearing a scrambler just to not to hear the scream of the the tuba. So that's how the imagination goes. Right. The next is cannabis. 
cannabis was misused or misused even now the active alkaloids or cannabinoids tetra hetra cannabinol the various parts of the plants flower and leaves is called marijuana and has she's they are all used now also but uh, rather they are all become illegal then uh, the famous ubiquitous uh, ethyl alcohol it was tried to clear the pain associated with so many conditions medieval so often it is mixed with other alkaloids and we don't know when human human civilization has started brewing ethyl alcohol but even now it goes very strong so as i said these were all the surgeries performed those days so the requirement of surgical field for anesthesia is very limited just to hold the patient cut the perfuse when the patient screams or uh, getting fainted nobody bother so in india also they have attempted surgery even before christ as we all know shushruta has started couching cataract surgery as i said the main uh, the hurdle in the development of anesthesia was because of religion because the eve has listened to the serpent and as she has ate the apple then only she started having all the kinds of emotions including pain so god has to punish she has listened to the serpent so oh, the pain is a punishment to the man thing so god has given that pain if you don't attempt to relieve the pain but slowly the industrial revolution started taking place the because of world war 1 and 2 the industrial revolution so many chemicals cylinder the metal, metallurgy everything have to develop so at that time so many people started experimenting with many chemicals and one of that is nitrous oxide nitrous oxide was found to be very interesting so many people uh, started uh, so doing so many experiment with uh, nitrous oxide and humbri devi was one of the unfortunate person he has uh, ventured into nitrous oxide experiment and even he found out that it has got pro- it processes anesthetic property even even he mentions uh, he he writes as nitrous oxide in its extensive operation appears capable of destroying physical pain it may probably be used with advantage during surgical operation that is with its notes but he missed it he his as in present it so those days so many uh, lectures some traveling lectures they used to take place they used to make fun out of it with so many chemicals they mix acid and alkali the fumes comes like that in those lectures lectures they were using nitrous oxide as a laughing gas just to, they asked the audience to come to the stage make them inhale nitrous oxide and if the people if the people become euphoric and started laughing so people used to make fun out of it so that's how even cartoons appeared on those days it's a prescription for scolding wives it seems if they inhale they become laughing something like that so nitrous oxide was used that way then the horaswell came into the picture horaswell he was practicing dentistry he designed some dentures but his business was not flourishing so why he when he wanted to analyze it he came to know that the pain associated with plucking of tooth the, the, the dental extraction was excruciating and so many people fainted that because of that so many they don't come to the hospital at all so he wanted to improve his practice he was searching for some pain relieving procedure for dental extraction at that time he came across a traveling lecture like this and he found out that uh, the nitrous oxide can be a remedy for him so he had the courage of extracting his own molar to thunder nitrous oxide he brought nitrous oxide from the traveling fellow he came to his clinic he asked his assistant to plug his good tooth healthy tooth and he didn't find any pain probably you have inhaled uh, very nicely so he thought he has found a miraculous drug so that's how we you all know that immediately he announced the surgeons in boston i am ready with the drug you can uh, have it for the surgery it will make the surgery painless but unfortunately he has selected a wrong drug you all know that nitrous oxide is a very weak analgesic and it has to be inhaled more than 100% then only it can produce a one max so what happened the patient complained pain so he was forced out of the like the theater saying that it is a humbug so after the debacle a very uh, unfortunate thing happened he couldn't believe that uh, he has failed 
so he went around he uh, he had a quarrel with the one of the lady he threw sulfuric acid over to the ladies then he was present then he committed suicide in the jail itself then that's why it is said it is not the one who discovers matters it is the one who convinces the world will win that's how martin in the 10th 16th october 1846 a successful demonstration but he has selected ether now instead of nitrous oxide so 1816th october is celebrated as world anesthesia day all over the world following the discovery of ether and successful surgery but people were not happy with the ether so all over the world especially in britain people started searching for some other alternate drug so one of the drug and uh, james simpson he used to uh, try for so many drugs in his home suggested by so many chemical friends at that time one fellow by name david david waldi he suggested chloroform uh, doctor you can try this drug so this is a famous dining table experiment in his house the simpson and his family they inhaled the drug in the previous night and next day morning they woke up under the table the uh, chloroform was so powerful they it knocked them out so from that day onwards we are called the chloroform doctors and the beautiful simpson is the first baby born to a mother who received chloroform for pain was named anesthesia so coming into the next follow up by through the chloroform days john snow a famous anesthetist a epidemiologist also he introduced these kind of uh, instruments in the for application in obstetric anesthesia then that's how the general anesthesia started developing on the next side the local anesthesia the erythroxylum coco this is a plan where the south american aborigines they used to chew for creating euphoria so those days those continuous chewers they started developing many psychiatric problems so sigmund freud who was the father of psych- psychiatry he started investigating those people why these people develop the psychiatric problems then he also tried some coca leaves and found out that it produces numbing of tongue so it occurred to him that it can produce some anesthesia so he suggested this uh, is man psychiatric man suggested carl kohler his ophthalmic friend because uh, carl kohler was not happy with ether when you give ether for an ophthalmic surgery you know that the problem associated with vomiting retching the intraocular surgery the problem with the opening the uh, eye eyeball will be a problematic one so he was searching for some other drug which can produce an immobile uh, eyeball and without any side effect so when sigmund freud suggested this coca leaves can be crushed and this alkaloids can be used when he tried he was uh, he was very happy so he presented in the german optical Con- conference and that's how the cocaine was bought so never but uh, F- sigmund freud he never claimed i have only suggested so i should be the father of local anesthesia because he has deemed to be, become very famous in psychology psychiatry so he didn't claim for it so th- that's how the first uh, in 1884 local anesthesia was bought but nowadays uh, the cocaine is misused not for anesthesia as a snuff then the significant uh, historical event which has happened is in the introduction of tobacco rarity this is a uh, plant where it was used as an arrow poison in the south americans so they used to coat the arrow with this alkaloids of pentrodentan and they used to store the alkaloids in either a tube or a pot so that's why in the retrospective you see it is uh, it was named as tube tobacco rare in tea tobacco rare in so uh, pot curare or tube curare they used to call so they used to coat the alkaloid over the arrow and used to shoot the animals since it is not toxic when it is consumed the animal will remain edible even after hunting so when people started uh, investigating what is the and side by side they demonstrated the neuromuscular junction physiology everything then with uh, courage griffith and johnson they introduced this curare in the surgery and they started controlling the ventilation from that day onwards the surgery surgical development and anesthesia development as uh, come to this era because they were not able to open the cranium and also thorax without in patients in spontaneous ventilation so only when the patients were made paralyzed 
then only surgery developed. So from that time, time onwards, see, we, we could enter into the major cavities and we started acting as a messenger of God to relieve the pain of the man pain. And uh, I hope the journey continues now. So that will, uh, we are almost halfway through. We have finished one part of the history and another one I wanted to uh, tell you about this, how our boils apparatus evolved. Day in and out, we are using our boils apparatus and the name daily we are mentioning. Let us, uh, let us go through a brief history of boils, how it developed. So he is a British man. So since we are all colony countries, we started following the British uh, methods. That's why we are following boils. American countries, they use the, some other machines. Ohio, I think. So we are British colonial countries, all the, uh, all the countries we are using boils. Even now it has changed into, the farm has changed into many farm and no longer a boils machine is found in our workstation. All the system is changed. So going through the history of Boyle's machine, you can see this was the anesthetic ornamentarium some 150 years back. Very simple, just like a tea filter. So it is not complicated. We have few bottles with some liquids, some foam mask, that's all. Those days, it was considered as an art, that's all. How to make under a person without struggling, that's all. They used to pour chloroform, they used to pour ether, ethyl chloride, something like that. It was considered as an art rather than a it is not based on any scientific method. Then the, you can see this is the first uh, anesthetic, anesthetic equipment used by Martin, a bottle with the soap, ether soap sponge, that's all. And slowly it got developed one by one. Hager, he developed his inhaler, likewise Clover, an, in, an intelligent man. He only found that monitoring during anesthesia is very important. He showed the importance of monitoring the pulse. He is his father. The patient, what he has shown here is his father, just to demonstrate that a pulse has to be monitored during the surgery. This is his ether apparatus. So then he which has developed for chloroform, he has developed a, an ingenious uh, apparatus where exhalatory, uh, exhalatory uh, valve is designed very beautifully. That's how it works. Likewise, junkers, he can push some air into the chloroform so that he can under the patient very easily. Slowly, one by one, as the need developed, those machines started developing. Magil, the famous Ivan Magil, he has developed his apparatus. Slowly, the stand started appearing. You, they want to fit some vaporizer. You can see a, 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 a bath, water bath is kept to, outside the ether bottle so that it can provide some heat buffer for the vaporization. That's how the Magil's uh, apparatus worked. How the then Mekison. Mekison developed the intermittent flow for dental extraction especially. When the patient, he can inhale. Slowly a uh, stand appeared in the design of machine. And side by side, the World War I. World War I, no? it necessitated the people to go for uh, field anesthesia. So to give anesthesia in the field, no? the Oxford University has asked Epstein and McIntosh to develop an apparatus. That's how the EMO has developed. So war is interlinked with the development of our field. That's how with the bellows, we can give anesthesia. And I am fortunate enough to give anesthesia for 10 or 15 cases with this bellow. Air, ether, and relaxant. For even for upper abdominal surgery, we have given in 80s. So then the teeter apparatus, one by one, it started developing. Once the oxygen was filled in cylinder because cylinder was developed those days. Then metal, uh, the metal, uh, the industrial development occurred. Then slowly people started filling the oxygen in a cylinder. So slow, the cylinder has to be fit in the machine. Like next, naturally, a stand has to be devised. Likewise, slowly stand came into the picture. All uh, the cylinder story and the vaporization story. Then the important development is cotton wood apparatus because the Boyle has visited US and he has seen this machine, this one and Watami machine. Uh, and he, he, after seeing those machines, he came back to Britain and then he developed his own. He is a left handed fellow. So he developed his machine that was called as the Boyle's machine. Till now it is being named. Then side by side, circle absorbers started appearing because cyclopropane was introduced into the field. Cyclopropane was explosive and expensive. 
so people wanted to reuse it so the uh, the need for developing a circle observer came into the picture so circle observer was developed and as you all know the water canister what does he developed this is a simple vaporizer so sorry simple uh, absorber the the main advantage is the the conservation of the heat and humidity with this the main disadvantage it is very close to the patient so inhalation of the dust particles occur and then coxter is devised likewise slowly the boils is shaped into the present uh, present day design you can see a water bath over the uh, ether vaporizer and then uh, this is one example of a vaporizer ether vaporizer where it is measured and bubble through copper kettle vaporizer you can see how many cylinders are fit and color coding was not rampant on those days it was not mandatory this is a working principle of copper kettle in then in america ohio side by side they developed since we follow the british system we, we haven't followed much about american system but ohio has developed many interesting equipment in the anesthetic arena so this is the wireless apparatus in the 70s you can see the ether bottle likewise this is the uh, this is uh, this is a mark 3 halothene vaporizer and this is the ether vaporizer you can see this is looking unique uh, the the one bottle is ether vaporizer and one bottle is soda lime canister so there is a vac vaporizer vaporizer inside circle is also there then coming to the 80s trilene came into the picture and the problem of trilene you know it is not compatible with soda lime so they have to provide a lock so this trilene vaporizer is linked with the common gas outlet so that trilene cannot be given when closer it is on so trilene lock was introduced into the wireless apparatus and then the pin index safety system slowly the problem started occurring by miss uh, connecting the when the cylinders so pin index one introduced in 1952 likewise this is a very beautiful valve device by uh, heat bring because those days spontaneous ventilation was, was in the order most of the time we don't paralyze even uh, in our days in 80s we used to give spontaneous ventilation for so many ortho cases so this valve played a major role in providing anesthesia just uh, one minute ventilation is enough a magel sac tube with a heat bring valve he device it meant and that's how the heat bring valve works a simple procedure a simple design and uh, the vaporizers once halothene came into the picture it was very powerful so and potent so the vaporizer size decreased because it uh, it can anesthetize a person with a very uh, compared to ether and chloroform so even with the 1 or 1.1 1.5% it could anesthetize a person so the vaporizer size reduced this is a goldman vaporizer even just 10 years back it was used all over the uh, our uh, our area but slowly it is also being withdrawn by the uh, developed vaporizers and uh, tech series vaporizer came into the picture mark 1 mark 2 just like ambassador mark 1 mark 2 slowly mark this is mark 3 and from that time onwards mark 4 mark 5 mark 6 mark 7 and each one has its advantage over the past one and in so many system have been introduced interlocking system filling system the safety has improved and uh, and still till now we have the vaporizer start uh, evolving and so many new designs have come into the picture the one thing i should not forget in the development of history is uh, even some uh, 10 years back we used to see so many airway fatalities we used to hear from our colleagues in the remote area in the peripheral area even in the cities the airway catastrophes without lma without buji and mekai so many catastrophes have occurred we have we used to rush we used to save and we have lost patients because of airway problems but after the introduction of uh, this lma uh, almost death has become nil because of airway so this is his original design so i should not forget in mentioning this so that's how the our machine and uh, the anesthetic field has developed now it has come up to this uh, you don't find a flow meter everything is electronic and you you appear you happen to be like a yeah, airline pilot where all the controls and uh, us the equipment is being added to the 
ornamentorium it becomes complicated also and the pre uh, pre induction check must be perfect so that you land up in problem that's how we developed from the uh, handkerchief soaked with ether from that time onwards slowly we evolved and we have come to the stage of robotic surgery with anesthesia so evolution is a part of uh, any field and anesthesia is not an exception so that's how it's a brief glimpse we cannot completely cover the history of anesthesia especially the drugs how they got developed how when it was introduced uh, it's very difficult to cover even then let let me give a glimpse of history and the interesting part alone so that all the youngsters at least once you go through the history the first hundred years of anesthesia there is a book a beautiful book and the interesting part is how there, there is mentioning in that book about the entry of anesthesia in india also since india was a british india those days the introduction of ether taken place one month after the introduction in america in britain so in another month october it was introduced in america in january it was introduced in calcutta so calcutta was the headquarters at that time so the next hospital which used the ether was chennai madras medical college so so many interesting thing uh, was mentioned in the book everybody i advise you to go through that book i thank uh, the organizers of online anesthesia for giving me the opportunity hope it it acts as you just is you to find out more history in the textbooks thank you so on and on thank you very much sir that was a very enlightening lecture and i uh, hope all pgs will get the spark to read uh, more about history in their books sir it is always interesting to read especially the history in while we used to read it again and even now when i get chance i read while so pgs should read it and they should get inspired from our predecessors who have done a lot for our field thank you very much sir uh, look one sir we may for the final discussion ah yes thank you thank you i hope there, there should not be any uh, doubts regarding history there should not be any doubt about history that there is one uh, query and what is the name, author of the book you just, had just mentioned sir uh, i also forgot and it is in our library mari mari college library i can get it and uh, put it in the online the whatsapp group thank you okay. sir uh okay let's go on to the session 2 it's a very interesting exhaustive session on spinal anesthesia by our uh, uh, edward johnson sir sir is a professor in hod of kanyakumari medical college he is the past president of tamilnadu isa and has been an associate editor of ij he has presented many papers and editorial write ups in many uh, international journals he has been awarded the gark education in, uh, initiative award in 2017 we are eagerly waiting to hear from you sir the very detailed lecture on spinal anesthesia welcome sir thank you sir thank you for your kind introduction as i said it is going to be a extensive topic because i have covered from anatomy physiology to the practical tips so in my topic i am going to cover the functional anatomy of spinal blockade surface anatomy pharmacology of local anesthetics pharmacokinetics of local anesthetics glass pain model and technique of uh, spinal puncture and equipment for spinal anesthesia so pharmacodynamics of spinal anesthesia so management of hypotension after spinal anesthesia and also finally the clinical situation encountered in in our daily day to day practice so it is going to be really a uh, big topic so regarding the history carl koller first used the cocaine for anesthetizing the cornea and conjunctiva and followed by that william halstead and richard hall used used to inject the cocaine into the tissues and nerves and produced uh, localized anesthesia and they have performed minor surgeries and followed by that james L. leonard coning is the first one who administered the cocaine in the spinal anesthesia spinal canal then uh, a short history about the csf a neurological fluid was first noted by gallen in the year ad 200 and csf was later studied in 1500 by antonio valsalva and dura puncher was described in 1891 by winter and that it was followed by 6 months later by quinky so august call gustav bayer in 1898 he is the first person who demonstrated spinal anesthesia for himself he administered uh, spinal anesthesia for himself in his own house in his guest house he was not able to get up from the bed for 3 days because of the severe headache and giddiness and he lied in the bed in the 
guest house and uh, his wife was searching for him for three days. And followed by that, his uh, assistant, Dr. Otto, has accepted to administer spinal anesthesia for himself. And uh, August Bayer has done a series of experiments on uh, his assistant, Otto. After giving spinal anesthesia, he hit his uh, tibia with hammer and he made incision the, on the thigh and he also squeezed his uh, scrotum, but uh, Otto didn't fail, feel any pain. And followed that, Tate and Coido have performed first spinal anesthesia in the United States in 1899. And Rudolf Matas is the first one who has given morphine in the spinal anesthesia. And Tufier popularized spinal anesthesia in the Europe and Gaston Labatt popularized spinal anesthesia in the USA. So the uh, wide publication of the spinal anesthesia come to a halt in the year 1947 after the report of widely published Woolley and Rowe case report in the United Kingdom. The Woolley and Rowe are the two patients who are admitted in the same hospital same day. They have undergone spinal anesthesia. Followed that spinal anesthesia, they have developed paraplegia. So most of the anesthetists thought it is due to the spinal anesthesia. But in the subsequent court of law, they have proved it is not due to the spinal anesthesia, but it is due to the contamination of phenol present in the spinal ampule. So for a long period, the anesthetists are afraid to perform spinal anesthesia. But in year 1954, Trips and Vandam described the safety of the spinal anesthesia. After that, spinal anesthesia became popular throughout the world. So the functional anatomy of spinal cord, Koning once stated in 1900 that I advise those who contemplate practicing spinal anesthesia to take a look at the skeleton, especially the lumbar vertebra. The intelligent gland, glands of this sac, sac will, will be more than many words. So let us have a look at the vertebral column. Vertebral column has your four curvatures, that is cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral. The cervical and lumbar are uh, convex, convexity anteriorly and your thoracic and sacral are convexity posteriorly. So this curvature along with the varicity of the local anesthetics and gravity and patient position determines the level of the spinal anesthesia. So there are 33 vertebrae, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 4 coccygeal. If we look at that uh, anatomy of the lumbar vertebra, this is the body, this is the pedicle, this is the posterior spinous process, this is superior articular surface, this is inferior articular surface. So in between the two pedicles, there is a foramen called intervertebral foramen through which the spinal nerves emerge on either side. So this is the posterior view of the vertebral bodies. So the inferior surface articulate with the superior articular surface of the lower vertebra. The space in between the two lamina is the interlamina foramen through which we are approaching the spinal anesthesia. So if you see the curvature, lumbar curvature, the third lumbar space is the highest and the thoracic, the fifth thoracic vertebra is the lowest. So there are five ligaments. The first is the supraspinatus ligaments that connect the epicenter of the spinous processes. It starts from the seventh vertebra to the sacrum. Then the interspinous ligament, it connects the spinous process together and posteriorly that is yellow color, that is ligament of flavor. It connects the lamina above and below together. So in the posterior aspect, the anterior longitudinal ligament and posterior longitudinal ligament, they together uh, connect the vertebral bodies in position. So the thickness of the ligament of Levum in lumbar region, it is 3 to 5 mm and height is 15 to 16 mm and width is 16 to 20 mm. So coming to the three membranes, so that you, you know the dura matter, it's outermost. The dura sac extends to the second sacral vertebra. The arachnoid membrane is the middle layer and the subdural space lies between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter. The arachnoid matter ends like dura at the S2. So the pyre matter, it is closely clinches to the spinal cord and it ends as a phylum terminal, which helps to hold the spinal cord to the sacrum. So the space between the arachnoid and pyre matter is known as the subarachnoid space. The spinal nerves travel through this space along with the CSM. So coming to this, uh, length of the spinal cord varies according to the age. If you see in the first trimester, the spinal cord extends to the end of the spinal column. But at the fetus ages grows, 
So the vertebral column lengthens more than the spinal cord. So at birth, the spinal cord will be at the L3 and adult, it will be L1. So there are eight cervical nerves, but only seven cervical vertebra. So the cervical spines one to seven numbered according to the vertebral body above, sorry, below. So the eighth cervical vertebra exits below the seventh cervical vertebra. So after that, the spinal nerves are numbered according to the vertebral body above. So up to seven, it is numbered according to the vertebra below. And after that, it is numbered according to the vertebra above. So coming to this autonomy nervous system, we are, the, you know, the sympathetic nervous system is the thoracolumbar outflow and parasympathetic nervous system is the craniosacral outflow. We are more concerned with sympathetic nervous system. So I am going to talk about the sympathetic nervous system only. So it starts from the intermediate lateral column and lateral horns and exits through the anterior roots from T1 to T2 spinal nerves. So see, this is the, it exits through the anterior nerve root and goes to the parasympathetic ganglia, sorry, sympathetic ganglia. So the communication between the anterior nerve root and sympathetic ganglion, that is pre-sympathetic ganglion is called weight ramus communication and post-sympathetic ganglion is called gray ramus communication. It goes uh, and combined with the subsequent spinal nerves. So there are three cervical, 12 thoracic, four lumbar and five sacral ganglia. Of this, only cervical ganglia are named as superior, middle and inferior. You know, the inferior cervical ganglia fuses with the first thoracic ganglia to form the stellate ganglia. So, the neurotransmitter in the post ganglionic sympathetic nerve system is the noradrenaline. It acts on the alpha 1 and alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 receptors. So, the main function of sympathetic nervous system is to maintain the tonicity of the blood vessels. So, it maintains the blood pressure. But the only exception is the coronary vessels and skeletal muscle and external genitalia. When the sympathetic system is stimulated, there is a vasodilatation of the coronary vessels, skeletal muscles and external genitalia. So coming to the surface anatomy, so the lower end of the scapula corresponds to the T7 and the highest iliac crest, the highest point of the iliac crest, if you connect both sides, it passes through the T L4 or intervertebral disc of L4 and L5, it is called Tufius line. Then posterior sacral, posterior iliac spine connects through the S2. So a dermatome, a dermatome, what do you mean by a dermatome? It is an area of sensory innervation by a sensory fibers from a single spinal nerve. So T10 dermatome corresponds to umbilicus, T6 corresponds to cephoid and T4 corresponds to the nipples. So these are the dermatomal level which is needed for each surgery. So upper abdominal surgery, you need a dermatomal level of T4. For intestinal gynecological urological surgery, you need a level of T6. For TRP, you need a level of T10. For vaginal, T10. And for the lower leg, you need L1. For foot and angle, you need a level of L2. And perineal and anal, you need S2 to S5, saddle block. So coming to the pharmacology of local anesthetics. So a brief pharmacology. There are two types of uh, local anesthetics, you know, it is amino esters and amino amides. The structure is the aromatic lipophilic portion and intermediate chain. Both are com combined together by this amino amides or amino esters. You remember the amino amides means there are two I. So any drug that comes with two I, that is lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, pubivacaine, etidocaine, rupivacaine, levobubicaine, all comes with two I. So it belongs to the group of amino amides. Then amino esters, there is only one eye. So the drugs, cocaine, procaine, tetracaine, chlorprocaine, benzocaine, all comes with one eye. So it corresponds to amino esters. It's an easy way to remember the group of each local anesthetics. So coming to the local anesthetics, what is the, how will you determine the potency of the local anesthetics? So the potency of the local anesthetics depends upon the lipid solubility. Low lipid solubility means low potency. So that drug need high concentration. For example, bibuacaine, is a high lipid soluble, so it need a low concentration of 0.5 percent. But lidocaine compared to bubiocaine, it is a low lipid solubility, so it needs a high concentration of 2 percent. Likewise, the potency is determined. Then the duration depends upon the protein binding. Suppose the protein binding affects the duration, the higher the protein binding, longer the duration of the action. So bubiocaine has a high protein binding, it has a long duration of action. Then the onset is depends upon the availability of the base form. So if here example is here, there is 
lidocaine, it has a pKa value of 7.9. What do you mean by pKa value? pKa value means the pH at which the drug exists 50% in the unionized form and 50% in the ionized form. So for lignocaine in 7.9 pH, it exists 50% in the unionized form and 50% in ionized form. But in, in a supply, it is supplied as pH 6. So 1% is in the unionized form, 99% in the ionized form. When you inject this drug into the tissues, in tissues, there is a pH of 7.4. So 24% remains in the unionized form and 76% in ionized form. Remember, this unionized form only can cross the lipid membrane. So this crosses through the inside the cell. So inside the cell, the pH is 7.1. So 14% remains as the base form and 86% in the ionized form. You remember that only the ionized to act on the sodium channel from inside. So 86% it will act from the inside. So potency, depending upon the lipid solubility, tetracaine is a highly potent. Bubiakin comes second, lidocaine, then mebiakine. Onset, the pK value. So the pK value is closer to the physiological pH means more drugs will be in the unionized form. For uh, lidocaine, it is 7.9. So it is close to the physiological pH compared to the bubiakine. So it is quick onset. But if you see chlorprocaine, it is well away from the physiological pH. It is 8.7. Still, it is the quicker answer. How it is possible? Because by the high concentration of 2 to 3 percent, the pKa effect is offset. So, alkalinization also speeds up the answer because it produces more unionized form. So, pharmacokinetics of the local anesthetic is a subarachnoid space. So, once you deposited the local anesthetic in the subarachnoid space, so what is the fate of the local anesthetic in the subarachnoid space? So, it is determined by the four factors that is, Concentration of the local anesthetic in the CSF and surface area of uh, contact of the nerve tissue exposed to the C local anesthetic. So, local anesthetic enters into the nerve tissues by um, way of diffusion. So, there are also there are some, some other pathways, they are called periarterial virtual robin space. So, through which the drugs are taken. This is the periarbital virtual robin spaces. And third thing is lipid content of the nerve tissue. So if, if there is more lipid content, that is uh, myelinated fibers, it will take more drugs. Likewise, the blood flow to the nerve tissue, if there is more blood flow, more drug will be eliminated quickly. That's why the local anesthetic is greater in the posterior spinal cord compared to the anterior spinal cord. They say the blood supply in the anterior spinal cord is high, so the drug concentration is low. Uh, but the Posterior root of the spinal nerves are thicker than the anterior root. Still, they are more blocked than the, they are more susceptible than the anterior thin motor nerve. How is it possible? Because this the posterior nerve root have a component of bundles. So, they a, increases the surface area of contact of the local anesthetics. So, more local anesthetics concentrated on the nerve tissues and the concentration is more on the posterior surface. So, so the posterior sensory nerves are more susceptible than the anterior motor nerves. So coming to this more controversial topic that is differential sensory block. That is the order of susceptibility, susceptibility of the nerve fibers to the local anesthetics. So different books says different uh, nerves susceptibility. So first we will know what is the nerves. The nerves available are classified as A, B, C. A is myelinated, B is myelinated, C is unmyelinated. So, A alpha is proprioception and motor, A beta is touch and pressure, A gamma is motor spindle, A delta is temperature, that is cold temperature and short pain, B is myelinated, it is forms the pregangalonic sympathetic fibers. This is the most sensitive susceptibility nerve. The C is unmyelinated, it is a controversial fiber, it uh, transmits dull pain, temperature that is warm and sympathetic postganglion. So, if you take this uh, ninth edition of Miller, it says, B is more susceptible than C, that is followed by A delta, A beta, A alpha. But Kutzen Pharmacology 13th edition, the susceptibility is in the range of B and C susceptibility is same, followed by A fibers. But Ganam Physiology 23rd edition says C is more susceptible than B than A. But this figure is taken from the Hustic manual. Here, the uh, susceptibility order is B, A, C. 
So it is completely different from other books. So the author has to uh, say the myelinated fibers are more susceptible than the unmyelinated fibers because the, in myelinated fibers, the local anesthetics gets pulled near the axons, so they are more susceptible. C fibers have no uh, myelination, so the area of contact, that is concentration at the acting on the fibers is less. So he is the, that is the reason he is giving in his book, Hasdik. But remember, absolute relationship between fiber size and anesthetic block does not exist. This is from the Collins. But the order of loss of sensation is fixed for all spinal anesthesia. So the first uh, sensation lost is the vasomotor block. So there will be a dilatation of the skin vessels. So increased blood flow to the skin. Then block of the cold temperature. Now the patient feel a warmth due to the cutaneous vasodilatation. Then the temperature discrimination will be lost. Then slow pain will be lost. Then fast pain will be lost. Then tactile sensation, then motor paralysis, pressure sensors, and the last one abolished is the proprioception and motion shifts. Then how to test the level of the block? The sympathetic system can be tested by sympathogalvanic reflex, that is the skin resistance. From the skin resistance, they can assess the sympathetic block. The cold is assessed by the alcohol swab, and temperature, there is a temperature difference of 0.8 to 1.6 degree the skin temperature is above the core temperature due to the vasodilatation. Then motor blockade, it is assessed by the bromide, bromide scale. This is the bromide scale 1, 2, 3, 4. 1 is complete block. 4 is the failed, failed block. That is complete, uh, incomplete block. So the complete block, that is unable to move feet and angle. So almost, that is 2. That is grade 2 is able to move his feet only the big toe. Partial block means just able to move the is just able to move move and flex both sorry just able to flex only the knees but complete failure means he is able to flex knees hip and able to extend the lip hip knees and hip so coming to the spread of local anesthetics in the spinal csf stout principle for spread of restoration so stout has uh, proposed here seven points as a stout principle uh, for the spread of the solutions. So he says the height of anesthesia is directly proportional to the concentration of the local anesthetics and inversely proportional to the rapidity of the fixation of the anesthetics and directly proportional to the speed of injection and directly proportional to the volume of the fluid and inversely proportional to the spinal fluid pressure and directly proportional to the specific gravity for hyperbaric solution. In case of isobaric and hyperbaric solution, the extent depends on the position of the patient. Few points of the Stout principle is, is not proved subsequent uh, experiments. So this is the ninth edition Miller. I have taken from ninth edition Miller. Here the distribution depends upon the, the factors they have mentioned is the more important factor, less important factor and not important factor based on the drug factors, patient factor and procedure factor. So most important factors that determine the distribution of the local anesthetics in the CSF is the dose and varicity of the drug, CSF volume, advanced age, pregnancy, patient position and epidural injection after spinal anesthesia. The less important factors are volume of the local anesthetics, concentration, temperature of the injection and viscosity. And patient factors, weight, height, spinal anatomy, intra-abdominal pressure, and procedural factors, the level of injection, the fluid current in the CSF, and the needle orifice and needle type. So these are the less important factors that determines the spread of local anesthetics in the CSF. So not at all important is the additives other than opioids and menopause and gender. So the another important factors that determines the spread of the local anesthetics in the CSF is the Varicity. So, what is density? What is specific gravity? What is varicity? So, density is the mass per unit volume. Specific gravity is if you compare the density of one liquid to a standard liquid, that is, water is taken as a standard liquid, specific gravity as one. So, if you compare the density of one liquid to the water, it is specific gravity. Suppose you compare local anesthetics density with the density of the CSF, which is called varicity. So, specific gravity means water is one, we are comparing with water. 
So baricity means CSF, it is one. So we are comparing the local anesthetics with the CSF. So here, these two drugs, tetrakine and lidocaine in 0.33% water and 0.5% in water are density lower than the CS, uh, CSF. So it is called hypobaric. Here it is density similar to the CSF, so it is isobaric. Here density is higher than the CSF, so it is hyperbaric. So here a small demonstration of glass spine model by Dr. Lenny Gray. For the first part of the demonstration, I'm going to inject a solution made hyperbaric with dextrose and stained with wax and indrudamine. And on this occasion, the patient is lying on her side. So the patient is lying in the lateral side. He's injecting the hyperbaric solution. Inject the solution. It cuts it for the nerves of the taken needle out. Now he is going to tilt the patient into the supine position. And turn the patient onto her back. And the heavy solution runs in both directions, cordad and keflad, in the subarachnoid space. What runs cordad is achieving nothing further in the way of a nerve block because the cordial pine has been cut off. So the drug has descended to the caudal and also advanced to the keflad direction up to the level of thoracic T5. Now he is going to tilt the patient head down. So you what? To the mid thoracic region. Even if the patient is tipped head down, and this would be quite a steep head down tilt on a bed or table, the solution will only run another segment or two before it begins. So he tilted the patient head down in, in the supine position. Now the cuffle direction, it moves one or two segments above, but it uh, does not move above the T5 or T4. But he, now he is going to turn the patient to the lateral side and tilt the head down. You see. To slow down again. On her side, but even a little bit head down, there is nothing to stop the solution running higher into the upper thoracic, cervical, and then even, indeed even the intracranial subarachnoid space. So this is more important. In lateral position, it may be a lateral or lateral. So when you tilt head down, there is no protective mechanism of thoracic curvature in the lateral position. That will be lost. So you will get high spinal anesthesia even to the cervical region. That is more important. So when you put the patient in head down, don't put in the lateral push. So now he is going to give the uh, spinal anesthesia in the sitting position and turn the patient to the supine push. For the first part of the demonstration, I'm going to inject a solution. For the next part of the demonstration, I'm going to inject a hyperbaric solution with the patient in the sitting position. And if you can inject very slowly, which sometimes is difficult, into the lowest sacral segments. So it uh, drips down to the caudal region. The caudal equina. And this gives, if you inject just slightly quicker, uh, which would be about L2 or thereabouts. But the local anesthetic moves very little up in the subarachnoid space, perhaps a segment or two. So it is more concentrated in the caudal, so it is called saddle block. Now he is going to turn the patient to the supine. Demonstration, we take the solution. It cuts across the nerve roots in the cord equina. And turn the patient onto her back. This would be wedged, of course, if it was a cesarean section. And once again, Please listen carefully what he says. Local anesthetic runs both ways in the subarachnoid space. I think it's worth noticing that the dye in the cold end of the sac here is quite intense. And this is because an unpredictably high portion of the local anesthetic gets trapped in the caudad part of the, of the lumbar convexity. But on the thoracic end, it once again runs down 
to the lower part of the thoracic concavity. But in this case, it is just possible that the spread uh, of dye, can, you can see, is less intense. So although the block goes high enough, it may be uh, a rather in, less intense block uh, and may last less time. So this is more important. When you put the patient in the sitting position and give spinal anesthesia with hyperbaric solution and put the patient at the supine, it drag on both sides, caudal and cephaloid. But the cephaloid, the intensity of block will be less compared to the give a spinal anesthesia given in the lateral push and turn to the patient into the supine. So the, the intensity of block will be less in the cephaloid regions. So the duration will be less. So whenever you give a spinal anesthesia for a cesarean section, it is okay. But when you are giving a spinal anesthesia in a sitting position for a hysterectomy, the cephaloid blockage will be less intense and the block duration will be likely to expire very early. So you have to keep this in mind. So next important uh, factor that determines the spread of local anesthetic in the spinal can canal is the volume of the CSF. So the CSF is secreted 0 0.4 ml per minute. So if you have lost 20 to 30 ml of CSF, it will, it will be replaced just in one hour. There are 150 ml of cerebrospinal fluid in the vault. So it is only 25 to 30 ml is in the subarachnoid space. So anything that decreases the CSF volume in the vertebral column by your obesity, pregnancy and increased abdominal pressure, these all cause the dilatation of the epidural vessels that compress the dura and reduces the spinal volume. That will produce higher, higher blood. But it is very difficult to predict the level of spinal anesthesia because of the wide variability of the CSF volume differs from individual to individuals. So it is a rough calculation. You can expect to find 1 ml of CSF for every vertical level above S2. Suppose mid lumbar L3, the volume will be 5 ml. So mid thoracic, the volume will be 15 ml and foramen magnum, the volume will be 25 ml. So coming to the rate of injection, always you have to give a spinal anesthesia with a speed less than 0.5 ml per second. So the rate of injection and its uh, correlation with the height of spinal anesthesia is unpredictable. So here, if you see this picture, here one ml is given 5 seconds, here also one ml is given for 5 seconds. The mean level is T11. But here, the one ml is given for 5 seconds, then one ml is given for 10 seconds. In this patient, the level is T9, but in this patient, it is T11. So it is unpredictable to assess the height with regard to the speed of injection. So the coming to the barbitage, what is barbitage? This is a technique of mixing the local anesthetic and CSF and produce a turbulence in the spinal canal, that by, thereby increasing the height of the spinal anesthesia. So while giving the spinal anesthesia, you have to withdraw some CSF into the syringe and mix thoroughly with the local anesthetics and once again, you inject into the spinal canal. So it will cause a turbulence in the CSF and the level of uh, blockage will be much higher. So this is the dose, duration and onset of local anesthetics. All of you know, will be again as duration of 90 to 110 minutes and onset is 5 to 8 minutes. Lidocaine, 60 to 70 minutes. Onset is 3 to 5 minutes. So coming to the additives uh, to the local anesthetics, you know, the uh, popular additive is the opioids. So opioids how acts uh, in the spinal canal. So there are three mechanisms. One is it is acts on the dorsal horn opioid receptors. Second is through the CSF is spread to the cerebral opioid receptors and there it acts. And after systemic absorption, it acts and exhibits the systemic effects. So highly lipid soluble fentanyl and sufentanyl, they are more rapid onset and shorter duration of action. If you know the potency compared to the intravenous, it is 10 to 20 is to 1. Hydrophilic opioids are morphine, dimorphine, mepridine. They have highly slow on uptake and elimination is prolonged. So their potency is compared to the intravenous, it is 200 to 300 to is to 1. That means 1 to 5 milligram in the epidural, 100 mics to 300 mics in the intrathecal. 
So the vasoconstrictor, epinephrine and phenylephrine has been used. They act through the alpha immediate vasoconstriction. So the uptake is reduced. So there is prolongation of the duration. It acts mainly along with detrakine and little with lidocaine, but uh, not much with bubiacaine because bubiacaine has its own property of vasodilatation. Then alpha-2 agonized clonidine and expeditrobidine, they act on the pre-junctional and post-junctional post alpha receptors and the Hans cells. Then neostigmine, neostigmine, all of you know, it inhibits the breakdown of the acetylcholine. So there is accumulation of the acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is an anti nociceptive It also acts through the release of the nitric acid in the spinal cord. So other additives are midazolam, ketamine, adenosine, tramadol, magnesium, and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So coming to the indications, so we have already seen so upper abdominal surgery, lower abdominal surgery, lower limbs, and perineum. So the contraindications are absolute contraindications are patients' refusal, coagulopathy, infection of the local site, severe hypovolemia and shock, increased ICT, an allergic to drugs, and severe AS in EMS. In the uh, ninth edition of uh, Miller, they have mentioned IATI stenosis and mitral stenosis in the relative contraindications. So every book says a yeah, different relative contraindications. So uncooperative patients relative contraindication, pre-existing neurological deficit. If there is any pre-existing neurological deficit, like in your polio, you have to mention the neurological deficit in the pre-spinal itself. So it will stand in the court of law. Then if there is a severe spinal deformity was once thought as a relative contraindication, but at the advent of uh, Ultrasound, it is no more contraindicated. Then infection at the site or at remote sepsis is also one of the con con relative contraindications. So the side effects, minor, moderate, major. So minor is nausea, vomiting, hypotension, shivering, transient, itching, and your urinary retention. Moderate is the failed spinal postural puncture headache. And your major is the direct needle puncture or needle trauma to the nerves. Then infection, abscess, meningitis, and vertebral colonial hematoma. It is a dire emergency. Patient will go for paraplegia due to compression. Then spinal cord ischemia, cauda echina syndrome by the repeated administration of the local anesthetic in the spinal CSF, and also increased concentration. As in the case of a, that is spinal, that is continuous spinal anesthesia. So it is no more. We are doing continuous spinal anesthesia. And arachnoiditis. The drug mostly causes the arachnoid is lignocaine. So we are not using lignocaine no more in the spinal anesthesia. Then peripheral nerve injury. Then coming to the total spinal anesthesia, cardiovascular collapse and death. So the technique of spinal puncture. Suppose your uh, uh, attender is available to help for giving spinal anesthesia. You must hold the patient in a fetus position. One hand on the head and one hand on the feet. And the patient should fold his leg and hold the knees with both hands and the attender should give pressure with abdomen over the folded knee. So this is the spinal position by with the, with the help of an attender. Suppose the attender is not available, the patient should lie on his lateral side in fetal position by holding the flexed knee against the abdomen with his two hands. And that the gender variability so in a female, the pelvis is broader than the shoulder. So the vertebral column likely to tilt towards the cephalic direction. And in the male, the shoulder is broader than the pelvis. So the vertebral column likely to tilt towards the column. In sitting position, always give support to the legs. This is the jackknife position. It is used only for the hyperbaric solutions. So this is the recommendation for spinal anesthesia. This is nothing but how uh, aseptic precautions we have to give the spinal anesthesia. So the layers we pass through when giving spinal anesthesia in the midline and uh, paramedian approaches. In the midline, skin, subcutaneous tissue, and two ligaments, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and the ligament of labrum, then dura mater, subdural space, arachnoid matter, and subarachnoid space. In the paramedian approach, we, we will miss the supraspinous ligament and interspinous ligament. So skin, subcutaneous tissue, paraspinous muscle, ligament of labrum, dura mater, Subdural space, arachnoid matter, and subarachnoid space. So, coming to the midline approach, the introducer is placed in the midline and it is in the cephalid angle of 10 to 15 degree. The spinal needle is passed through the 
to introduce her. Once the spinal needle passes through the dura mater, you can feel a pop. When the pop is felt, you have to remove the stillet and watch for the free flow of the CSF. You have to wait for 5 to 10 seconds because we are nowadays we are using only smaller size needles of 26 to 29 gauge. Suppose there is no free flow of flow of CSF, it just rotate the needle for 90 degrees. Those are the problems encountered in giving spinal anesthesia. So this problem is discussed in Collins in other books. Suppose you contact bone first, then you try to imagine what is the depth of the contact of bone. Then you withdraw the needle up to the skin and re redirect. Suppose once again you hit on the bone, suppose the depth is greater than the previous one, you are likely to hit the inferior spinous process, you have to redirect to the cephalite. Suppose the depth is smaller than the previous one, the first one, then you have to imagine that you are likely to hit the superior articular surface, then you have to tilt the caudal. So this is a tips given in the Collins. Every time you have, you have to withdraw the needle to the skin for redirection. So the paresthesia, suppose you felt paresthesia giving during spinal anesthesia, what you have to do? You remove the stillet. Suppose there is no CSF flowing through the needle, you are likely to hit, hit the uh, spinal nerve in the epidural space. You redirect the needle. Suppose you remove, uh, felt the paresthesia and you remove the stillet and there is a free flow of CSF, then you are likely hit the nerve in the subarachnoid space. You rotate the needle and use spinal nerve local anesthetics. Suppose while giving the local anesthetics, patient is having any excruciating pain, then you should not give the drug. You have to withdraw the needle. The needle tip is inside the nerve. So coming to the lateral approach, so you first to palpate the, uh, that is your interlaminar space and infiltrate one centimeter lateral to the superior aspect of the inferior spinous process. Then introduce your drug your introducer and spinal needle in the medial and cephaloid direction. Suppose you hit on the lamina, you walk over the lamina and enter the subarachnoid space. The only resistance you felt here is the ligament of flavor. So this is the Taylor approach. Here, one centimeter medial and inferior to the posterior superior iliac spine, you, your needle should be introduced in a cephaloid direction of 45 to 55 degree medially. So, you are likely to enter the largest interlaminar space of L5 and S1. And after inserting the needle, the first resistance you felt here is the ligament of flavor. So, this is the continuous catheter technique. Here, you are first you have to introduce the Tuhi needle, that is, sheath over the Tuhi needle. So, once you introduce the Tuhi needle and identify the epidural space, then you introduce the spinal needle. The spinal needle also sheath over the needle. So if you enter into the spinal canal, you remove the stillet and see the free flow of CSF. Now you thread your cannula through this spinal sheath. You can remove the epidural sheath also. So you can fix along with the spinal sheath or your spinal cannula. But remember to label it is a intraspinal catheter. Otherwise, you are likely to inject the epidural dose in the independently into the spinal canal and end up in high spinal anesthesia. So the equipment for spinal anesthesia, so all of you know, nowadays we are using only spinal needles with the removable stillet. The advantage of a stillet is it prevents the skin and our adipose tissue being carried to the subarachnoid space. So there are two types of needles, all of you know, it is pencil pine needle and cutting bevels. So pencil pine needles are Sporotti and Whitaker. They have an rounded non-cutting bevel, but the opening is 2 to 4 mm from the tip of the needle. The cutting needle is the quinky and pitkin. In quinky, it is a medium length cutting needle. Pitkin is a short bevel needle. And greeny spiny needle is a rounded body point and rounded non-cutting bevel. The advantage of pencil point is you can better feel the tactile sensation and the incidence of post-dural puncture headache is less. When you use bevel needle, your bevel should be longitudinal to the supraspinous ligaments because it will split the ligaments rather than cutting the ligaments to reduce the incidence of the PDPH. So this is the quinky needle. It is a medium cutting needle. This is the sporotic pencil pine needle. 
the opening is 2 to 4 mm from the tip. Then Vitagra is the pencil point needle and Greeny is the round cutting, non-cutting bevel and Pitkin is similar to Quinky cutting needle but the sharp cutting bevel, bevel is very sharp. This is the 2 he needle. So the pharmacology, pharmacodynamics, so, so far we have seen the pharmacokinetics of the local anesthetics. Now we are going to see pharmacodynamics of the spinal anesthesia. So all of you know it will produce induce hypotension because of the pregangulatic sympathetic nerve block and direct circulatory effects, relative adenoid substances, skeletal muscle paralysis and ascending medullary vasomotor nerve block and also concurrent respiratory insufficiency. So coming to the hypotension, there are two schools of thought. One is preload theory, another is the afterload theory. In preload theory, what they say is 80% of the circulating blood volume is in the venous side. So when there is a vasodilatation, there is stasis of the blood in the venous system. So venous return reduced, so your cardiac output reduced, so your blood pressure reduced. But afterload theory, what they say is it reduces the systemic vascular resistance and there is vasodilatation of the arterial side. So the cardiac output initially increases and the resistance, systemic vascular resistance is reduced. So your blood pressure that is after load is reduced. So this is the afterload theory. So this is an example. This is a beaker with fluid. You remember this is a blood vessel with blood. After spinal anesthesia, the, there is a vasodilatation. So the beaker size is increased. So the level of the fluid falls down. So the pressure at the bottom of the beaker also falls. Suppose if you want to increase the pressure at the bottom of the beaker, what will you, what you have to do? You have to pour more water. So the water column raises means the pressure at the bottom of the beaker will raise. Likewise, you can do, sorry, you can reduce the diameter of the beaker. So you, the water level will, will increase. So the pressure at the bottom of the beaker will be also increased. So the treatment is you give either fluid or vasoconstrictors. So this is minimum systemic filling pressure. What do you mean minimum systemic filling pressure? Suppose you imagine your heart stops. Your vascular system is filled with certain amount of the blood and they exert pressure. That pressure is called minimum systemic filling pressure. It is about 7 mm of mercury. So the volume is called unstressed volume. So suppose you add a more fluid or blood over this minimum systemic filling pressure, it is called stressed volume. This stressed volume causes return of the fluid, that is return of the blood to the right atrium and it increases the cardiac output. So in spinal anesthesia, the all the volume available is converted into the unstressed volume. Now you have to add more fluids means you increase the stress volume that increases the venous return and increases the cardiac output. Or otherwise you give vasoconstriction. If you give vasoconstriction, the stress, unstressed volume is converted to stress volume that increases the venous return and that increases the cardiac output. So this is the mechanism of treating the post spinal hypotension. So there are four receptors come into play in spinal anesthesia. So what is baroreceptors? All of you know baroreceptors are situated in the carotid bodies and cranial nerves 9 and 10 is the efferent. And when there is a hypotension, there is no, there is less pressure on this stretch receptors. So your decreased sympathetic activity, so your vagal nerve is less stimulated. So simultaneously sympathetic overactivity causes increased heart rate increased force of contraction and vasoconstriction thereby increasing the blood pressure. Remember this baroreceptors reflexes come into play when there is a hypotension. And there are some other reflexes are there, brain bridge reflex, reverse brain bridge reflex and Bessel-Geris reflex. So what do you mean by brain bridge reflex? In the laboratory, they have cannulated dark's superior vena cava and they have given one liter of saline very fast and they have noted there is a tachycardia. So it is due to the stretch receptors or a mechanoreceptors that present in the right atrial wall and cavoatrial junctions. When it gets stimulated, it inhibits the parasympathetic stimuli and it increases the sympathetic stimuli and produces tachycardia. So coming to the reverse brain bridge reflex. So when, whenever there is a high spinal anesthesia occurs that is involving the T1 to T6 
that is cardiac sympathetic fibers, there will be bradycardia. But the bradycardia occur even in spinal anesthesia where the fighter block is less than T4, sorry, T6. Less than T6, they have noticed bradycardia. So in these patients, when they raise the legs, venous return increased and the bradycardia is abolished. Suppose the bradycardia occurred in the low spinal anesthesia is due to the blockage of the thoracic sympathetic fibers. The raise of the legs will not abolish the bradycardia. So they thought it is maybe due to some other receptors. So it is nothing but the same vein bridge receptors situated in the atrium. That is less stimulated. So your parasympathetic stimulation get activated and that produces bradycardia. But remember this reverse brain bridge reflex occurs only in the spinal anesthesia. And your brain bridge reflex comes into play only when there is volume overload. So coming to the Bessel-Geris reflex, it occurs in the spinal anesthesia. So the receptors are present in the left ventricle. It occurs when during spinal anesthesia, when there is a hemorrhagic shock, that is volume is depleted uh, and there is a hemorrhagic shock, this uh, reflex come into play. So the receptors are present in the left ventricular wall and unmyelinated Weger afferent type C fibers through which it passes through the medullary vasomotor center and stimulate the parasympathetic tone and produces bradycardia. So it is a triad of bradycardia, hypotension and peripheral vasodilatation. So remember, it comes into play during spinal anesthesia when there is hemorrhagic loss of blood. So the risk factors associated with hypotension. So what are the risk factors that aggravate the hypotension after spinal anesthesia is your hypovolemia, pre-existing hypovolemia, your preoperative hypertension. Suppose, suppose the patient has a preoperative hypertension, they will have a active sympathetic tone and their circulating blood volume will be reduced. So after spinal anesthesia, when there is a sympathetic block and vasodilatation, they will likely to get severe hypotension. Then high sensory nerve block, so more sympathetic blockade, age older than 40 years, obesity, and combined spinal and general anesthesia. Remember, during spinal anesthesia, when the tone of the sympathetic tone is lost in the arteries below the block, there will be a compensatory vasoconstriction above the block, that is in the upper limb. So in general anesthesia, what happens? It is it suppresses the compensatory vasoconstriction in the upper limb. So you are likely to go for a high spinal uh, hypotension. So then chronic alcohol consumption is interesting. Patients with chronic alcohol consumption have prone for more hypotension. Then elevated BMI, then urgency of the surgery. So they have done a uh, retrospective analysis of more than 300 patients and they analyzed what is the contributing factor for the increased occurrence of the post-spinal hypotension. So interestingly, the chronic alcohol consumption Yes, there is increase in certain 14 percent compared to the 5 percent. In urgency, in emergency surgery, there is high incidence of hypotension, 11.6 percent compared to 5.2 percent. And previous history of hypertension, yes, previous history of hypertension, 9.8 percent compared to 3.9 percent in the non-hypertensive patients. So ASA physical status, first is 3 percent and ASA risk to 4 is 9.5 percent. But interestingly, they have analyzed the hypotension between the surgical department. If you see trauma, ortho, urology, general surgery, gynecology, and others, the hypotension is less in urology department case, urology cases and more in the gynecology cases. That is 11.8%. So coming to the management of the hypotension after spinal anesthesia. So management is non-pharmacological method. You have to position the patient, general blood position, leg compression, uterine displacement. Prevention is Preloading with colloids, co-loading with crystalloids, lower limb compression. They give low dose of local anesthetics by adding additives. Treatment, you give vasopressors and fluids. Phenylephrine is given when there is a hypotension tachycardia. Ephedrine, if there is hypotension with bradycardia. The problem with the ephedrine is tachyphylaxis and fetal acidosis. Then whenever there is bradycardia, you give atropine, ephedrine, or epinephrine, any one you can give. When there is a severe hypotension with bradycardia, you go for directly to the epinephrine. So this is the regimes of how to give phenylephrine. So phenylephrine comes with 10 milligram. So you add 10 milligram to 100 ml normal saline, get 1 ml. So it contains 0.1 milligram per ml. Then you start a infusion of 60 ml per hour. 
there are three regimes available for giving phenylephrine that is on and off in infusion regime here after giving spinal anesthesia you start the first two minutes you run the infusion of 60 ml per hour you have to stop this uh, infusion only when the systolic pressure is more than 150 percent of the baseline then after the uterine incision this is the regime is for the obstetric spinal anesthesia so the after second minute until the time of uterine incision you keep on flowing this infusion of 60 ml per hour it should be stopped when the baseline in the pressure systolic bp is above the baseline so this is the second method is the sliding scale method here increase the infusion rate according to the systolic bp from 0 to 60 ml per hour coming to the bolus regime this is what we are doing so you have to prepare a solution of 0.1 mg that is 100 mg per ml how to prepare you dilute the 10 mg to 10 ml then take 1 ml from the 10 ml then dilute to 10 ml so the resultant uh, solution will have 0.1 mg that is 100 mg per ml so the, you can give whenever there is a fall in bp so they have so there are so many ways to prevent the spinal hypotension so they have done a systematic review in the cochrane uh, library they have analyzed fluid drugs and physical methods and they come to a conclusion no single or combined prophylactic intervention avoids the post spinal hypotension so you can 100% you cannot avoid post spinal hypotension by your preventive measures so this is the interesting topics this is for the consultants so this is the supine hypotension syndrome of pregnancy is encountered in the obstetric uh, spinal anesthesia so the textbook says 15 degree tilt there will be relief of the ivc and iota but in a mri if you see at l2 l3 level 15 degree the there is femoral artery sorry iota is re released but your femoral sorry your uh, ivc is still compressed see your ivc is still compressed in 15 degree tilt in 30 degree tilt only your ivc compression is relieved so whether 15 degree tilt is possible that is 30 degree tilt is possible in your practice so we have done one uh, experiment so for 15 degree tilt we need one person to hold the patient on the table for 30 degree tilt we need three persons to hold the patient on the table so three 30 degree tilt is not for not at all possible in our practical purposes so imagine what will be the pelvic wedge tilt so they interestingly they have an article was published in analysis analysis regarding the iotocaval compression whether it is the time to revisit here they says 15 degree tilt never achieved in practice and out of 100 patients 75 patients only they have kept tilted for 15 degree by 21 anesthetist and only 3% of the obstetricians tolerated 15 degree tilt. 76% of the patients feel discomfort as if they are feeling sliding or toppling from the table. So the left uterine displacement does not appear to be practical in our practice. So what is going to be the take home message? For practice nurse, what the journal says, whenever there is a normal Olympic patients, you need not keep the tilt. When there is a hypovolemic patient, you always keep a pelvic tilt. So this is the general sense. But for practical purposes, I am doing a practice of keeping the pelvic tilt for all my patients and I have reduced my vasopressor usage less than 20%. So my advice to postgraduate is always keep a pelvic tilt, whether it is useful or not. Suppose it may be useful for one patient out of 100, but you are likely to save that one, one patient. So you always keep tilt of the pelvic tilt as much as possible. For practice nurse, it is up to you to take the message, whether you can tilt the uh, pelvic tilt for normal olympic, uh, hypovolemic patient and you can avoid the tilt for normal olympic patient. How to identify the normal olympic hypovolemic patient? My simple uh, advice is you see the catheter. In catheter, if you have a concentrated urine, the patient may be in a hypovolemia. If the catheter is clear urine, it is a subjective assessment only. It is not an evidence-based assessment. Then coming to this, 
tilt what they say systemic review says so, so there is one systemic systematic review published in the cochrane library it says the maternal position during cesarean section for prevention of maternal and neonatal complications they conclude that there is a limited evidence to support or clearly disprove the value of using tilting so there is no evidence to support or disprove so it is up to you to decide so coming to this uh, another school of thought they says the hypotonicity is due to the reduction of the afterload so they says the treatment should be vasopressor should be the primary therapeutic option and your fluids should be restricted only to the volume depleted patients or in the preloading or coloading what they say is if you give fluids it will reduce the viscosity and reduces the systemic vascular resistance and it will aggravate the hypotension so first line of their uh, treatment is vasopressor if you atropine and ephedrine is given for bradycardia so other effect of a respiratory effect there is no much effect because the arterial blood gas remains normal the inspiration is minimally affected but all patients feel dyspnea after spinal anesthesia so why they feel dyspnea because their inability to feel the chest wall movement during respiration they feel as if they are having a dyspnea difficult in breathing so in high spinal anesthesia what happens it abolishes the it paralyzes the accessory muscles of respiration so you are likely to get expiratory reserve volume increase sorry decrease where peak expiratory flow is decreased and maximum minute ventilation is decreased so in obstetric sorry obstetric sorry obstetric copd patients you have to be careful when the, there is a high spinal anesthesia so gastrointestinal system because sympathetic blockade unopposed to parasympathetic blockade increases the secretion and causes spinal relaxation and increases peristalsis and lead to nausea and your hypotension is also induced by the ischemic ischemia induced uh, serotonin release and hematogenic substances and hepatic renal blood flow is not at all affected so coming to the last portion that is clinical situation encountered in our practice of spinal anesthesia so in a case of a obstetric spinal anesthesia you have given the spinal anesthesia but it is not taken so what to do suppose if it is a single sort spinal there is inadequate spinal anesthesia before incision of the skin incision then you convert it to the ga or combined spinal epidural why combined spinal epidural you have already given local anesthetic in the csf so if you repeat spinal anesthesia you are likely to give a large dose of drugs in the spinal anesthesia and end up in high spinal anesthesia so if you go for combined spinal anesthesia you give more drugs on the epidural and you likely to give a little drugs in the csf so high doses can be avoided in the spinal anesthesia so you go for ga or combined spinal anesthesia so for every repeat spinal you better go for a combined spinal epidural then suppose you a patient feels pain before opening the peritoneum you convert to the ga suppose if the patient feels pain after delivery of the patient after opening of the peritoneum you convert to ga or go for a adjuvant uh, giving adjuvants like fentanyl bedazolam and ketamine but never administer propofol and thiobendone without securing the ap so how often you have to check the blood pressure after obstetric spinal so every minute you have to check the blood pressure until the delivery of the fetus because your uterus has no auto regulation so the dose of the local anesthetic is reduced in pregnancy why so there are two mechanisms i already told you the, the iota cable compression the ivc is obstructed so there is dilatation of the epidural vessels that compress the dura and reduces the spinal volume of the csf so small drugs cause high spinal blockade and another reason is there is increased fat in the epidural that also causes compresses the dura and reduces the volume of the csf in the lumbar region and increases the height of the spinal anesthesia but they have noted the requirement of local anesthetics in pregnancy is well noted before 20 weeks of pregnancy because the supine hypotension syndrome come into exist after 20 weeks of pregnancy but the requirement is still reduced before 20 weeks of pregnancy so what is the reason so there are two reasons biochemical and hormonal the circulating progesterone level is high so that alters the 
receptor activity, modulation of the sodium channels, and also so, alter the permeability of the neuronal membrane. And your biochemical, so it decreases the CSF specific gravity. In pregnancy, the CSF specific gravity is low, and the, there is an acid base, base changes in the CSF. So there, there is the two reasons for the increased sensitivity of the local anesthetics in pregnancy that reduces the required dose to 40%. But when it comes to return to the normal, it is 8 to 24 hours in the postmortem. And some book says it is 48 hours. So coming to the high spinal and total spinal. So we are often using the word high spinal, total spinal. So when it is called high spinal, suppose it affects the thoracic T1 to T4, it affects the cardiac sympathetic fibers, there will be hypotension of the bradycardia. It is high spinal axis. Yeah. Suppose it affects C6 and C8, it affects hands and arms. There will be paresthesia and numbness of the hands and weakness of the hands and arms. And there will be shortness of the breath due to the accessory muscles of respiration is lost. Suppose it blocks C3 and 5, diaphragm and shoulder. There will be shoulder weakness. Whenever there is a shoulder weakness, where a patient complains, we were of the diaphragm paralysis also. So there will be hyperventilation, desaturation, and respiratory arrest. If it is extended into the intracranial spread, it is called total spinal anesthesia. So a brainstem is affected where there is vasomotor center is there. So you will have slurred speech, sedation, and loss of consciousness. When the patient go for loss of consciousness due to intracranial spread, it is called total spinal anesthesia. So whenever there is a high spinal and total spinal anesthesia, look for the signs and symptoms. Then you call for help. Then you immediately, immediate management should be if there is a continuous flow of the epidural infusion for uh, your uh, labor allergies, yeah, first you have to stop that infusion. Then you can give a reverse tendal bug. Reverse tendal bug is to restrict the upward spread of the local anesthetic in the CSR. Then give high flow oxygen. If there is a severe hypotension, you give tendal bug uh, tilt also. Then you have, you have to assess ABC airway breathing, circulation. Suppose the patient is unconscious and there is severe hypotension, you have to intubate, ventilate the patient and you have to plan for emergency LACs. Suppose the patient is conscious and circulation only compromised, then you go for a left lateral tilt and also go for the fluid and vasopressors. So this is the signs and symptoms you have to Look for that is hypotension, bradycardia, respiratory compromise, apnea, reduced oxygen saturation, slurring of the speech, and cardiac arrest. The neurological symptoms. So, bradycardia treat with vagolating sympathomimetic, hypotension, or vasopressors, respiratory dysfunction, intubate and ventilate, loss of consciousness, secure airway, and supportive measures. So, always you talk about the unilateral spinal anesthesia. So, how to give unilateral spinal anesthesia? So, you have to be concentrated on the type and gauge of the needle density of the local anesthetics and position of the patient and speed of administration of the solution, the dose, concentration, volume. We have to concentrate on the dose, concentration, volume of the local anesthetics we are going to inject. So slow administration is the must with low doses and hyperbaric and hyperbaric solution can be used. So for example, suppose you are using hyperbaric solution, you keep the affected part dependent. Hyperbaric, you keep the affected part non-dependent. Then keep the lateral decubitus position for 15 to 30 minutes. When using hyperbaric 0.15% bubiarcaine, the unilateral block prolongs according to the dose you used. 4.5 milligram for 2 hours, 6 milligram, 2 hours, 15 minutes, 7.5 milligram, 3 hours, like that, the duration will be increased depending upon the dose. So, how to prepare a hyperbaric 0.15% bubiarcaine? It take 1.5 ml of the 0.5% hyperbaric bubiarcaine. You add distilled water 3.5 ml, total 5 ml. So the total 5 ml contains 7.5 milligram. Each ml contains 1.5 milligram. Suppose you want 4.5 milligram, you take 3 ml. If you want 6 milligram, take 4 ml. If you want 7.5 milligram, you take 5 ml. So this is the anticoagulated patients. For unfractured caparine, you need, you need not wait for 5,000 units. If you have more than 5,000 5, units BD, you can wait for 4 hours or 2 hours. Then you are using a low molecular weight heparin. Prophylactic dose, you have to wait for 12 hours. Therapeutic dose, you have to wait 24 hours. For aspirin, you need not 
with withdrawal the aspirin for giving spinal anesthesia warfarin you have to wait for 3 to 5 days when the inr falls below 1.3 so coming to the last slide so nowadays everybody is talking about thoracic spinal anesthesia so what do you think about thoracic spinal anesthesia it is a unorthodox technique infrequently used so it is not mentioned in any textbook so i am taking a class to the post graduate so i am using the word unorthodox technique infrequently used because i have to go through the textbook teaching only so the textbook teaching is you have to give spinal anesthesia only below the cauda equina but they are giving spinal anesthesia in the thoracic region how is it possible so if you see the mri the spinal cord is very close to the posterior dura in the lumbar region and it is close to the anterior dura in the thoracic region there is a space in the posterior dura for your to accommodate your spinal needle tip so in the anterior leg in the thoracic region there is the 9.5 to 1.8 mm space is available in the thoracic region so whenever you use a uh, th thoracic spinal you better to use a cutting needle rather than your uh, pencil point needle because the pencil point needle the hole is 2 to 4 mm distal to the tip so when you observe the flow of csf in the pencil point needle your tip would have already pierced the spinal cord so cutting needle once it enters into the spinal canal you can see the flow of csf so what is my uh, the advice of using this thoracic spinal anesthesia since there is absence of large trials only small cohort studies and multiple case reports are available it may be considered safe and feasible and effective only in the case of high risk patients not in elective patients so these are the doses uh, and level and for the surgeries of breast surgeries gastrectomy laparoscopic cholecystectomy and others so with that we come to the end of this my presentation thank you so i have taken too much of time sorry so professor sir it is not too much of time it is very difficult to find such a uh, topic in uh, uh, in a short time it is uh, it is very difficult for the postgraduates to get this uh, amount of material also sir so it will be worthwhile for them we shall see if you questions sir uh, the first question is uh, putting spinal in prone, prone position and keeping the position in the prone itself how does the local anesthetic spread in that vertebral column so it is uh... opposite to the supine it has a level of spread is if you are using hyperbaric sedation the level is similar to the uh, keeping the patient supine after giving lateral spinal anesthesia but uh, they says that it is likely to uh, cause more block in the anterior nerve root what do you think salok master keeping the spinal in giving spinal in the prone position you unmute yourself Unmute yourself, sir. Hello, Kamsi. Yeah, prone position, spinal and prone position. Ah, uh, it is ah uh, given during the laminectomy surgery. Ah, uh, anesthetist generally we don't prefer spinal for ah uh, prone position for spinal. When laminectomy surgeries are done and prone already given conventionally spinal, turn the patient in prone. Surgery is going on. to extend the anesthesia some people are giving spinal in prone position itself just puncture the dura and give the drug so naturally as the curvature decides the lumbar lordosis and curvature decides the spread we don't know how the patient is positioned prone what are the supports given and generally it should not influence too much i have given i have seen people giving in prone during laminectomy and the spread doesn't uh, go to the higher regions so it uh, restricts itself to the lumbar and uh, lower thoracic but from the beginning you want to give it at a uh, in prone position i don't know what is the situation uh, forces you to give the spinal in prone during laminectomy i have seen and it doesn't affect anything the same thing super so, sir you are giving opinion on so from my uh, professors i have heard uh, uh, people giving uh, spinal in prone position hyperbaric solution sir but in uh, in the modern practice i don't think there is no indication to give a, uh, a 
prone position spinal cell they have used hyperbaric solution and uh, uh, they have done uh, perianal surgeries with that giant jack knife position i have heard from my professors but i have never seen one sir let us move on to next question sir uh, how about the uh, uh, presence of peripheral neuropathy is it a contraindication for subarachnoid block it's a never a contraindication suppose there is a no block there is no sorry suppose there is a pre existing neurological deficit we get a neurologist opinion and get down the neurological deficit at present before the spinal analysis yeah. so they can compare that uh, the deficiency in the uh, neurological deficit can be compared after spinal analysis yeah. if there is a, the same there is no problem so they, you can stand in the court of law also what do you think solomon uh, sir so what's your opinion sir to so professor sir i think we you are you have answered it sir it's not a contradiction at all yes uh, can reverse bain bridge reflex be prevented with co-loading or pre-loading of fluids sir so it uh, acts only when there is a hypovolemia so when there is no normovolemia by your pre-loading it will not occur so the concept is the same if there is a volume uh, reduced so there is a receptor stimulation is reduced so there is a radical so if uh, the receptor stimulation is not there by your preloading or co-loading then it will not occur uh like we say sometimes i have seen sir when there is a uh, hypotension treating with the pure vasopressor once the bp comes up uh, reflex bradycardia sometimes happens like when we use phenylephrine uh, sometimes uh, the rate goes down sir uh, but i don't have not seen with uh, ephedrine bradycardia but i have seen with phenylephrine sir so it is mainly maybe due to the arterial say it is a barrel receptor reflex so the, the receptors there are, you, you must know there are receptors certain receptors in the venous side which helps in the case of hypotension there are some receptors in the arterial side only the barrel receptor receptors in the arterial side and the venous side the receptors are in the left atrium left sorry left ventricle right atrium and right ventricle so the main bridge and the reverse main bridge so whenever there is a Uh, increase in the sudden increase in the bp it may be due to the barrel receptor reflex causing reflex bradycardia mostly you will note in the mefendi 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 yes sir uh prema mama asked a question on uh, how to differentiate between a high spinal and subdural injection and what is the incidence of a subdural injection after spinal anesthesia sir actually i have included two slides for subdural anesthesia because it is not in the epidural class i have omitted that so subdural anesthesia there is uh, a criteria lubino criteria i think sir there is a lubino criteria that is two major two minor so the it's uh, the onset uh, must be delayed and uh, the more sensory than the motor so there are uh, certain criteria for the lubino criteria so if it fulfills the lubino criteria so the level of blockage will be disproportionate very high and it is mostly on the sensory rather than the motor Answer it will be delayed. So this is the criteria for subdural uh, analysis. One last question, sir. Uh, is it advisable to go for a second time spinal analysis here when the first spinal analysis fails? Sir? I already told if you are going for second spinal, you are likely to suppose that most of the drugs in the previous spinal is deposited in the CSF. You are likely to increase the dose, volume, concentration of the local anesthesia in the CSF. So better the advice is. go for combined spinal analysis combined spinal epidural so give drugs some drugs in the epidural give low drugs in the spinal canal so even though your previous drugs is available in the csf you are likely to increase the therapy that is uh, toxic dose less so that is the advice okay i think the questions are all sir how to give ephedrine for hypotension when to repeat and how much to give sir how to give ephedrine for hypotension and how i went to repeat and how much to give sir so it's uh, you take 30 mg dilute to 5 mg then you give 6 mg in graded dose that is the thing we are using for a long time so ephedrine is uh, one of the drug that tachyphylaxis occurs very early you know what, what is the reason so it acts through the vmat that is vesicle monoamine transport it acts as a substrate of noradrenaline so it releases noradrenaline from the receptors it is an indirect action 
So it acts as a substrate of noradrenaline and releases noradrenaline circulation. So the VMAT transport that is T1 and 2 is there. So one is uh, saturated quick. So the ephedrine uh, loss is effect. So nowadays we are going better for noradrenaline infusion also. So it acts through the noradrenaline, your ephedrine and your mephedrine. That is a long topic you know, we can discuss in the Yes, Time is up, sir. Can we have a question or we will find up, sir? Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. Thank thank you, thank you sir. For wonderful really excellent answer. day today, sir. Both the history of anesthesia by Selva Kumar, sir, and your uh, spinal anesthesia. I am sure the first year for the postgraduates will be benefited a lot because these two topics, if they start reading, it will take one month of the time. We have given them in, uh, in the period of two hours. Sir. So we will upload the YouTube link soon. And you will be able to again and again revise it and you know, take it into your mind. So next week, we'll, we will meet on, with another interesting session with uh, Physiology and Anatomy of Pain and uh, o, Pharmacology of Opioids. Until then, see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evan Rajis. Thank you, Manipa. Thank you. You can wind up. Thank you. <laughs>